You're listening to episode 20 of Lang FM, a podcast about the wonderful world of language, interpreting, and technology. My guest today is Linda Saukorauta, a sketchnoter based in Jyväskylä, Finland. interview was recorded in early February. A couple of minus degrees and then some snow, uh, so now it's quite mild and it's actually a nice nice sort of winter day. Quite normal compared to, let's say, a couple of weeks ago when we had like minus 25 or minus 30 even, so that was rough. The wind was blowing from Siberia. <laughs> Up in the north, Linda started out as a language teacher. So actually my major is Swedish, so I used to teach more Swedish than, than English. And, and then also I, I taught Finnish for our foreign students. And then became an e-learning designer. I tried to help the other teachers uh, to develop their e-learning materials and courses and ways, and ways of teaching. Some of them were really enthusiastic about the things that we were working with, while the others were more sort of... <laughs> restrained, so to say. Eventually, though, the doodles she drew in work meetings led her to set out as a freelance sketch noter. It was a hard decision for me to, to change into entrepreneurship. We'll talk about all of those things and more in today's episode, so keep listening. And you, you told me your languages are um, Finnish, English and Swedish. Did, did you learn Swedish as a child already? Is, is that part of the school education? Mm, no, I just picked up it in, the, in school. So um, Finnish is my native tongue. And then at the age of nine, I started learning English. And then at the age of 13, Swedish. And then after um, senior high school, gymnasium. <laughs> after that, I, I went to Sweden to study. Actually, I studied English. Uh, in Swedish together with Swedes so I got both languages <laughs> in a way interesting yeah because I, I wasn't quite sure because th I think there are minorities in Finland that speak Swedish and a Finnish speaking minority in Sweden as well yes there are yeah so that's why everybody has to study Swedish in school all the Finnish speaking kids they have to you know study Swedish so um, that's what I did when my time game came and then um I kind of was interested and drawn to languages, so I, did, I decided to study those in the university level as well. So actually my major is Swedish, so I used to teach more Swedish than, than English. And, and then also I, I taught Finnish for our foreign students at the, in the end of, end of my teaching career. Kind of had the other perspective to my native tongue as well. You know, working as a Swedish teacher in Finland, it has got some rough times because... There are people who don't necessarily want to learn something that they are forced to <laughs> learn. So uh, it, it, it was a bit rough at times. So I got bored with it and then wanted some change and then, then started that position as an, as an e-learning designer, which was fun. Yeah, because we had the same thing with Russian before the political change in 1990. Everybody had to learn Russian. And it must have been very difficult for the Russian teachers to get people, you know, enthusiastic about learning Russian. And uh, of course, all, everybody forgot everything once they didn't have to learn Russian anymore. So, Yeah. And then there are some freaks who, you know, like the language. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I don't know why is that why that is with the Swedish. I mean, it it hasn't been always like this. I mean, people used to like it, but I guess it it was in the in the sort of the late 1970s when they made it, you know, obligatory, and and then you know, back in the 1990s, probably it started out so that people people kind of didn't just want to do it anymore. There are studies that show that some like it a lot, and then there are studies who show that well, except for boys at the age of 14, they don't appreciate it that much. <laughs> Yeah, but the reason why we're having this this conversa conversation is that I'm I'm really interested in in what you're doing and what you're doing is sketch noting, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that what sketch noting is. Um, I, I learned about it 
for the first time, I think a couple of years ago um, on the internet and, and seeing people doing sketch notes for conferences and that, and that kind of thing. But before we get into the, into the nitty gritty, maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got into sketch noting. I think it all started with you just doodling in meetings and just making simple drawings, I think. Yeah, it has got to do with the change of, of the position, as I told earlier, so that I, I quit my teaching job and then started as a designer. And that meant that I, I actually had to sit <laughs> in a lot of meetings and, and more more seminars than than I used to. And I mean, in the early, I mean, as a teacher, you, you get to move around and, you know, be active in classroom while, you know, just, you know, sitting and listening. It gets boring, as you know, probably. And then I guess most of the people know. So I just, you know, I have always been doodling. I have always drawn and, and, and doodled, you know, back in back in school days, my school, you know, books. They were all kind of, you know, filled with characters and, and pictures and images and cartoons and characters and so on. So I just, you know, started doing that again um, in a workplace environment. And um, back in 2010, I guess, when I when I started my new job with the e-learning, I, I also bought an iPad. And I was kind of wondering what to do with that. And uh, I tested out different drawing apps. I have I had been testing out sort of those um, drawing tablets that you connect to computer, but I didn't like those that much because you lost the hand-eye connection. So the sort of the drawing line was suffering badly but once I got an iPad that drawing then that's that started to be fun again and uh, then I just you know, started doodling and then you know doodled my notes and scribbled my way through meetings and then suddenly people who sat next to me they started saying that well this you know kind of sums sums it up nicely so can you please send that JPEG to me so that's what I did and uh, yeah that's how I started out with it and then at the same time I surfed around surfed around the uh, you know the internet and and there were people who called themselves graphic facilitators and uh, they shared pictures of something they had done and it kind of resembled of the things that I had done and I showed them my my images well is this graphic facilitation well not really this is kind of like graphic recording or something like that. And then I Googled around and found out that there's a term called sketchnoting that is used in America. And sketchnoting is sort of the umbrella term for all those uh, things? Or is that the way you would describe it? Uh, sketchnoting is, yeah, it's kind of like uh, an, probably a name for some sort of like personal notes. There's always some kind of a personal experience that you bind into the notes. A graphic facilitator is more of a facilitator sort of brings for example a meeting towards a goal and so on whereas this is more organic and and as i say i put my own thoughts maybe sometimes into it and and how, what kind of what kind of thoughts kind of rise from the presentation that might also be included there because there are a few interesting terms there around the field. So there's visual listening, I think, visual thinking, real-time drawing. But I mean, the, 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 the basic idea behind this is to record what you hear and, and draw it and maybe draw also associations or uh, links that you see maybe to other things. Indeed, indeed. Kind of how would this look like if I draw a picture of it and then I draw a picture of it? Um, yeah, that's the thing. But it must have it must have been nice back then when you when you did all those drawings and then you finally discovered that there's a whole community out there and, and other people who do more or less the same thing or that do similar things. Yeah, yeah. What I've understood, it started out back in the 1960s, uh, somewhere in you know San Francisco area, where a bunch of hippies thought it would be, you know, useful for you know some kind of a new way of learning, um, sort of visual visual thinking as an aid for education. And then it has spread around. And uh, I guess in the recent years in Europe, I think the Danish have, have been quite active with this and then probably the Dutch as well. And then, of course, some some in London, in, in Great Britain, I think there are also active doodlers. And then now also I think Finland is, is also kind of, we have a small community <laughs> in a way of people who do this uh, a couple of, and then I know in Sweden as well, but yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And how did that happen for you? I mean, how did it develop from a hobby into something that you do more or less professionally, basically? Mm. Uh, it actually started out with, you know, some basic comic strips. Um, my life as a Swedish teacher was very dull and very, you know, <laughs> filled with ex anxiety. So I started out doing cartoons of that mundane life as a Swedish teacher in Finland. Um, and I... I shared my cartoons via my blog and then I got a couple of requests, offer requests um, and uh, and I actually had my company running already um, because of that, because I needed to, you know, be able to send bills <laughs> to those customers, those early customers. But I also knew that I couldn't make a living out of it because I'm, I'm not that good of a, you know, I don't have that good of a drawing technique when it, when it comes to, you know, car making cartoons. But anyway, it was fun, and uh, it was just basically a couple of accidents that got me into business. Um, it was, I guess, the biggest accident was was back in nine uh, in two thousand eleven, when um, when the Nordic Business Forum, the sort of the biggest business event seminar in in Finland or in Northern Europe, they they had the seminar in Uvescula here, and um, they had Al Gore. They brought Al Gore to to Finland. Those sort of young young guys, like uh, under thirty, kind of like twenty five or something. One day, this this uh, Hans Bet that he actually just you know phoned Al Gore's office. So can you come to Finland? Oh sure. <laughs> Basically, that was a story. But anyway, hard work. But it's a nice story. And and anyway, they organized this huge business seminar in Uvescula, something that was kind of never seen here. And um, the students of our, our university, they were actually working there at the seminar as volunteers. And they also asked us teachers and staff, could you be able to, you know, join our staff as a volunteer? And I actually volunteered for, for some driving action. action. I, uh, I, you know, I was, you know, ready to be a chauffeur for some VIP guests. You know, I was like, yeah, hybrid Toyota, why not? <laughs> And um, then we had some training for the position. So I drew sketch notes in that training session. And then I um, shared those notes together with my other driving colleagues. And then the organizers, they asked me, they saw the sketch notes and they asked, what if your volunteering job would be to sit in the front row and, you know, just doodle all the presentations? Sure happy <laughs> so the first time i did i was sort of volunteering for that one and then i shared the you know the sketch notes in my blog and then tweeted about it and uh next week or a week after that seminar then the so the business people started phoning me do you do this do you do this for a living do you do this you know for companies can we pay you to do this <laughs> yeah i had my company running already so so i was like yeah, sure. Why not? Okay, cool. So since then, basically, I have done it, you know, as a side business. Uh, but then a couple of kids and a couple of maternity leaves, you know, the Nordic system, long yeah. maternity leaves. So I had my calendar, you know, free. Uh, so then I was able to, you know, run it as a whole time business, which I do nowadays. I'm, I'm wondering, are you nervous at all when you get to, I mean, when you go to the conference and they pay you to record the sessions or to, to draw those sketch notes? Are you nervous at all that you're going to miss something? Uh, are you ever nervous that you're going to, you know, understand something maybe in a different way, that kind of thing? I'm, I'm, I'm asking this from an interpreter's perspective. So that's why that's why the question comes up. Um, of course, sometimes when it's a question of a, of, a, of a bigger event, you know, not every event that I go to is a Nordic business forum. There, of course, it's kind of extra uh, special because it's a huge event and it's a huge marketing place for me. And if you do, if I do mistakes there, then, you know, the top speakers from America will notice how bad I am or something like that. But uh, there, of course, I'm nervous, and and in other some other events, uh, if I'm, for example, connected to a projector and and the whole audience of 500 business suits see me, you know, do something um, that I'm not supposed to do, then probably then. But otherwise than that, no, not really. I I have learned to you know take my time and and probably also my years as a teacher, you know to be in front of a class have, have taught me something. 
I mean, it sounds quite scary, actually. I, I read that on your blog that you sometimes um, hook your iPad up to a connector and then everybody can see uh, what you're drawing in, in basically in real time, right? Yeah. So it's it's happening more and more nowadays. Actually, my first gig ever, um, that was at the Yamk University, I mean, my day job, daytime job, my first gig ever was actually that way. So I was I was connected to a projector already in the beginning, and it worked out really well. The 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 doodles itself they weren't back then five years ago they weren't that good at all actually awful to see back back now but i mean it worked really well because i was kind of connecting with the audience and and also responding to the things that the speakers said and and so on so the feedback was very good already back then uh but more and more people and companies they want me to you know show what i'm doing because it kind of also makes it extra special for the audience for example if they're trying to talk about a company head is, is speaking about let's say economical <laughs> details or strategy it's often quite abstract so they want to make it more concrete by showing what i do and and the people tend to be uh, amused by it yeah i read this one anecdote i think on your blog as well where you uh I think the session was getting close to lunchtime and everybody was hungry and the speaker would still go on and on and on. And then you would, I think you draw like a little figure that said, I'm hungry, I'm hungry or something like that. Yes, yes, I did. It was my alter ego that was thinking only nothing but lunch, 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 lunch. And, you know, the audience, they just burst into laughter and, and the speaker kind of, what's happening? And then he, he you know, saw the see white screen. Oh, it's lunchtime. OK. And then he quit and we were able to get some lunch but he was okay with that he was not offended or anything no no <laughs> oh, that's great excellent so do you do any um do you do any preparation like do you think of i mean when you get the topic for a for a conference or a meeting do you think of how to draw specific things do you prepare any symbols or, or stuff like that uh actually well, yes uh to some extent i of course google around for the speakers i mean who they are what they have been speaking about and if it's a huge event like nordic business forum i also tend to listen to some podcasts or or check out some videos so that i'm able to you know grab grasp their accent i guess that's probably something that the interpreters also do <laughs> oh yeah absolutely that's why i'm asking about it yes yeah so i do that and then um also i kind of wonder what kind of a presentation it's going to be if it's going to be a panel discussion that is quite clear that i'm going to draw it the specific way you know the talking heads and and what they are saying you know from from the uh, or using the canvas in a in a special way or uh, if it's going to be um, um, a discussion of two people for example then i have a clear strategy for that one as well and um, I think you also have a bit of a routine when you get to the location of how you prepare. So I, I suppose when you're connected to a connector uh, to a projector, sorry, you'll have to sort of check that everything works on the technical side, and uh, um, you probably have a look around the conference room, that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. The advantage of working with eye tools is that they normally work pretty well. You just you know plug it in, and then there you there you have it um but yeah i want to sort of find a suitable place so that i have space for my right arm because when i when i draw i i, I of course use that one and then um i have to also check that they have uh, long enough cables from the projector to the place where i sit and so on so yeah the tech technical preparation that doesn't take that much it's normally so that the organizers tend to be more in in you know panic when it comes to having a real-time doodler in the house whereas it's pretty easy for me and, and another question have you have you found yourself listening to interpreting at a conference have you have you been to any multilingual events where you had to rely on interpreting for the doodling um no not really i i have been working in conferences that are international but all the presentations have been in 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 English or Swedish, so I've been able to work work with my own language skills there. And um, how do you know what's important? I mean, is it intuition, the, the things that you pick up and that you then put on paper or actually put on the iPad screen? Mm. Well, uh, I have been around for a couple of years now. So when it comes to, for example, business seminars, uh, well, I pretty much know the, for example, the marketing jargon or the marketing language or the things that they are 
speaking about. So I kind of know <laughs> what they are going to say. Um, but also when it comes to people and, you know, people giving presentations pretty often, um, they, they say the most important things, you know, in the beginning of, of the sentence or in the beginning of a, you know, some bigger chunk of information. So if you're really alert in the beginning of, of that chunk of information, then you get it, then you grasp it. And then also kind of the rest of what they say is just, you know, packing up that information. Now, since since interpreters also take notes um, sometimes in meetings also f for their actually working technique, um, are there any tips that you have maybe or uh, anything that you can recommend if, if somebody wanted to maybe get more into sketchnoting and maybe adapt a few of the strategies for their own technique? Because I think there's a, um, um, a number of basic shapes, I think, also that you can employ. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's the basic circles, the basic boxes, and you know, uh, speech bubbles and and stars and and different types, the kind of different fonts, if you would like to say, <laughs> so hand drawn in different ways. And and uh, and then there are you know the characters. You might want to develop your own kind of character. Mine are kind of like those box headed um, characters. Um, Uh, and then there are other versions as well uh, that people use. Then there are dots and lines and underlines and, you know, highlighting shadows and everything like that that go together with comics and so on. So basically comic language. Um, and then you combine text and images and, uh, and you know, icons and so on. Interesting. Um, is, is there a, a book maybe that you can recommend? Anything in specific? There are a couple. I think uh, Mike Brody, uh, his book was pretty good actually because it had sort of some actual examples of of sketch noting, and also it had got those kind of like patterns or forms that you could use when you start your sketch note. I mean, if you start from the upper left hand corner or from the center, or do you probably use it? You know the you know the upper center point as your starting point and so on uh so that's uh, that's that's at least one book that i have um i have taken a look at but then there are others as well if you if you go and google around you know yeah. kind of like visual thinking and handbook and something like that then you might find But I think the Mike Rody book really is very good. I had a look at that and it seemed very interesting, even for someone like me who would say, I have no idea how to draw, but I think that's something that uh, you really have to get over yourself in a way and just start doing it and then just practicing. And he, he was kind of the first ones to use the term sketchnoting, I think, out there in the internet. And, and he was, you know, happy to share uh, other people's work as well. So so some of my work um, is also being shared and, and covered in his blog and so on. So I think he was also one of the main kind of um, people that got me also into sketchnoting in a way. Um, and, and you said that pretty much from the beginning, uh, you've been using an iPad for your for your sketches and for your notes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah for all the time. I haven't actually done any sketchnoting with with any moleskin notebooks or, or pens. Of course, back in school days, my, my notes were probably that way, but no, not, not as an adult, no. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the applications that you, that you use? Do you have any uh, preferred apps or, or maybe also styluses, if you can speak to that? Yeah, uh, well, my iPad is just a normal iPad Air 2. Um, and then the app that I use for drawing is still nowadays uh, Adobe ideas which i have been using all these years i have tested out other tools as well and i have to change my my drawing tool from ideas to something other pretty soon because they are not develop it, developing it anymore they are not uh, updating it anymore um, instead they have this adobe draw which is a free app that you can download and uh, start using but it's not that good it lacks some features that the ideas has and also the i don't like the zoom in it the zoom feeling is, is different compared to ideas and it's not that smooth uh it's sticky and you know when you're drawing fast in a seminar of real-time live dueling 
it it just gets you know in me into trouble if I use that one. But I have to make that change pretty soon. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's difficult if been if you've been using that um, specific application all those years. It is. It's very difficult, uh, and I know that I'm getting into trouble. But I, I mean, I should do it. Uh, so those, and then the stylus pen that I'm using is just a regular soft tip st- bamboo stylus, bamboo solo. Yeah. Yeah, those those tend to be recommended a lot. Yeah, they're pretty good. I think. Yeah, I've been testing around different styluses throughout the years uh, so but i just you know haven't found any better one i use um one with a hard tip for when when i create animated videos i i use a uh, it's an adenite adenite shot pro with a hard tip that's that i use nowadays for for the video activities but you know real-time dueling i do with bamboo solo and uh, so, you, so you do those um, uh, explainer videos as well? So uh, animated sketch notes, basically, or how does it work? Yeah. Um, in a way, yeah, yeah. So I draw, and then uh, my drawing is 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 taped on video, and then we uh, make it go faster and edit it and add sounds, and boom, we've got an animated video. Interesting. Yeah, I really like those, and uh, they're interesting to watch because you can sort of see the the whole process and and how the how the sketches and notes take shape. I, I really like those videos. Yeah. yeah. So there aren't actually that many who do those, at least not in Finland. So mm-hmm. so we are kind of trying to hit to market with our little videos. Excellent. Yeah. Have you checked out the new iPad Pro and the stylus from Apple? Uh, yes, I watched the launch and I actually drew sketch notes while watching it. Um, just this week, I actually held one in my hand and kind of felt out what, what, what the weight was and so on. And it's huge, actually, the iPad Pro. It, it feels pretty huge in my hand. So I, I, I guess I'm not going to buy one for the real-time live purposes when I'm away in seminar because there it would be just too big. But I guess I have to buy it for the video purposes because there, um, you know, the more surface you got, then the better it gets. Yeah, it's a bigger canvas, right? Yeah, hmm. in a way, yeah. I just found the stylus to be very, very good. And uh, because the the problem that I had with the traditional styluses was that you can't really put your hand on the screen because then you get all the smudges and that wasn't really an issue with uh, with the Apple Pencil. So that I really liked. Uh, I haven't tried out that one and I've heard that if you if you want to buy one, then you have to line up for it for, for six months or so before you get one. <laughs> it so, can take a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't really had my chance yet. Uh, would be fun to test out really and then when you when you're done with your work um you you, um well either you're connected to the projector or you would then send your sketches to to the organizers and they use it for their conference material or for their brochures or yeah i actually i actually already beforehand before the seminar starts i already send a a dropbox link to my customers to the seminar organizers and uh, during the seminar during the event i I upload uh, my images uh, into the Dropbox, so they're able to, you know, go and get them uh, already when the seminar is happening. So they're able to use them right away as, you know, marketing aid and so on, marketing material. Um, and that's what they do. Pretty often they do that. So they go and, and you know, take the image there and tweet it out and use it in their blog and so on. Uh, in Nordic Business Forum, I actually have access to their blog. So what I do is that after each presentation, I directly upload the sketch note in their blog. Uh, so it's kind of instant thing. And then they tweet about it then. Yeah, very interesting uh, indeed. And you also share uh, quite a bit of your material on your blog. I think you have a, a portfolio blog and also on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, it's it's a messy portfolio, but it's a nice blog, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, more and more of my customers want want me actually to share the work that I do. Of course, some a strategic, a strategic doodling, that's something that the companies don't want to share. But, but you know, quite often they want me to share uh, the things that I've done for them. Also, probably because, you know, you know, social media and that stuff, they, they want you know the basic there. It's good content, I guess, from their perspective. I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, it makes people, you know, people want to people want to take another look at 
it, you know, probably because of the details and so on. And uh, it has got sort of many sides to it when it comes to, for example, real-time live doodlers. So there's, for example, the audience who are present. So they get they get sort of a special moment while they watch how the how the image is 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 done and also they remember then back after the seminar they remember remember in a better way what was spoken about uh the speakers they like the images a lot because then they can see if their message is you know if it's come true uh, if people have understood it yeah, i hadn't thought about that but it's a good point yes yeah they really love it you know and also they are quite often um uh, sort of a me 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 person <laughs> so they kind of they love the idea of seeing their own words you know as an image yeah for, for posterity and eternity yeah 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 so they quite you know they quite they they really want to share you know always and they want to use it and they want there for their own purposes and quite often you see after a seminar uh, a speaker has changed their cover photo for example into a sketch note uh, so the speakers like it, and then the organizers like it because they get marketing material, they get you know instant visibility in social media, also during the during the uh, event, and uh, yeah, basically there are, as I said, many sides to it, and then also people who are not attending the seminar, um, if they're checking out, for example, the Twitter feed from the distance, they also get an overall image of what has. Been, well, I mean, what has been presented or what, you know, what the seminar is all about. So they also like my doodlings. I'm happy to share them. And I'm actually happy if they use the material because every gig that I do is also marketing for myself. I really enjoyed talking to Linda. And it was interesting to see all the overlaps between sketchnoting and interpreting. Like this one. It's hard to explain them what I do. It's hard to you know speak about it, what I do. And probably there are people who listen to this and they don't have a clue about what we're talking about uh, because it's hard to explain. But once people see it, once people see me in action and doing it, then they sort of get it and kind of like, wow, is that something that you do for a living? Yeah. At some point, Linda even tried interpreting herself. I actually tried out some interpreting back in, in my studying years. Uh, I, t- I took a course, uh, I, I tried out that one, was Swedish for Finnish, and it was very difficult and I couldn't do the simultaneous. I'm able to do it image-wise, I, I just draw what I hear. While she did go with sketch noting in the end, she still likes to keep in touch with interpreters. For example, in, in Nordic Business Forum, where, where they have the, you know, the interpreters sitting in their booths, uh, we actually bond because we kind of, we're actually kind of doing the same thing. It's, it's like interpreting. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, please subscribe in iTunes on your computer or in a podcast app on your smartphone or tablet. Simply search for Lang FM and never miss another episode. Also, a review is much appreciated. Thanks for listening and talk to you next time.